Good morning, everybody. Wait another minute or two here. Okay, let's do it. It's not the screen I wanted. Try that again. Still no. Sorry, rough start today. There we go. All right, so routine stuff, uh, grammar lesson six is posted. Make sure to watch that video, complete the requested items and turn in by Thursday night. Vocab lessons three, sections one through four, by tomorrow night. And your personal narrative semifinal draft, hopefully you're working on that. If you did a great job in the outline, it's not going to be too much work, but again, look over the entire rubric and make sure you're doing every single one of those things, things that most people almost all people probably didn't do in the outline. Um, obviously you need to format in the paragraphs and everything, but as far as the writing, you need to be adding transitions, adding more details and elaborate, and you need to have some kind of dialogue or figurative language to have a little bit of style to your paper. So make sure those things make their way in there that I can see them clearly and you should be able to get a good grade, okay? All right, so I want to reserve most of the time today for All for Love Unit, Romeo and Juliet Act 3 should have been completed last night. A lot going on there. It's kind of a long act. We were able to talk through scenes one and two, and I'm going to be uh, recording a video probably sometime during the lunch bell that will cover scenes three, four, and five. You just had questions on scenes three and five since four is really, really short, and you can watch that later to kind of finish up and make sure we're understanding the whole story and everything that's going on. Okay, switch over to the text here. Oh, if you guys could access your responses to the questions now while I'm getting the text up here. Go and do that right now so we can talk, get some participation, share your thoughts. This first one, first thing that Ben Vallejo says, oh, by the way, I realized, uh, and then a couple of people pointed out to me, thank you, that some of the line numbers are off on here, okay? So if you were, you know, had trouble kind of answering some of those, questions directly because you're having trouble which lines were being referenced. You know, that's okay. I didn't grade too hard, especially on that first scene. Um, I didn't get a chance to look back and, and figure out exactly where they were. These are some questions that I've borrowed from a colleague to kind of beef up my study guide for the situation. Um, and I think maybe No Fear Shakespeare has, for some reason, the lines are a little bit different. So apologize for any confusion there. Appreciate you working on it hard still. So we start off with Ben Villiers says, I pray the good Mercutio, let's retire. You know, let's go rest. The day is hot, the Capulets abroad, and if we meet, we shall not escape the brawl. For now, these hot days is the mad blood stirring. This always reminds me of springtime, not in a good way. 
because I run many schools, including here, once in a while, often, sometime in March and April, you get those first few hot days, inevitably a couple fights break out, and people getting out of hand outside or in the halls and stuff. He's kind of talking about the same thing, right? It gets hot, people are outside, energy is high, and uh, he's especially afraid if they meet the Capulets and get into a fight um, that the prince will have to, you know, hold by his promised consequence and execute somebody for fighting in the street. So it's a reasonable concern, right? But ironically, somewhat, um, so that kind of that kind of covers what Benvolio says, right? But then what is Mercutio saying about Benvolio? And who does that actually kind of sound similar to, which might make us like, you know, maybe certify at this point. And maybe he is really like that. What does he insist that Mercutio is like, both um, right here in the first things he says, and then continuing all through here with all these comparisons and exaggerated examples. He's saying that Mercutio basically what? I'm gonna expand my grid over here so I can see my, much more of you guys. Uh, Leah, you raising your hand there? Go ahead. He's basically saying that he will look for a fight with whatever he's, whatever comes up, anything he can argue or fight about is what he will. Good. Yeah, whatever reason that comes up, whatever excuse he can give for kind of like ending up in a fight, um, he will do. And Rikisho, it asks about the tone, right? He's not uh, using quite the same cruel, angry hot-headed tone that Tybalt is, right? Because they're friends. He's basically smack talking his friend, but he's annoyed with him, right? It's like, you're the one who's looking for a fight, right? Nobody else is looking for a fight. Um, true or not? Well, we don't know, okay? But they get one, don't they? Okay, so they continue talking and one person walks up, Tybalt and several Capulets, right? All right, there's the Capulets and Mercutius like, I don't care, right? Um, but we know what Tybalt's after, right? He wants a word with Mercutio or Benfolio because he knows that they are what? Remember what Tybalt is angry about in the first place, which is hardly anything, but he insists he's angry about it. What's he angry about and why does he want to speak to Mercutio and Benfolio? Hello, hello. <laughs> they know that Mercutio and Benvolio are friends with what person? Romeo. Of course, they're friends with Romeo because they are, well, not both of them are Montagues. Technically, Mercutio is a nephew of the prince, but he knows that he's friends with the Montagues um, and specifically with Romeo, right? Word with one of us, couple it with something. Make it a word and a blow, says Mercutio. Mercutio is always making jokes, right? He's saying, why, why, why just talk? You know, let's fight, get out your swords. So a blow with a sword, right? And he says, thou consortus with Romeo, which means you hang out with him. And of course, Mercutio turns that into a joke as if they're in a, you know, musicians in a group together. Um, and they go back and forth. Um, and Mercutio is just, you know, kind of making fun of him. But then Romeo walks up and Tibble says, well, peace be with you, sir. Here comes my man. There's the guy that I want to see, right? He calls him a villain. Oh, my God. And then Romeo has some really confusing words for Tybalt. Now, we know what he means, right? Because we know he's actually already married to Juliet. That's what happens in that last scene of Act Two. Okay, so dramatic irony, we know something these characters don't. He says to Tybalt, the reason I have to love thee doth much excuse the appertaining rage to such a greeting. Villain am I none, therefore farewell. I'll see if thou knows me not. I don't want to fight with you. He's basically implying, you know, kind of saying, but not in a way that Tybalt's going to understand that he's his... Uh, I guess you call it cousin by marriage or something like that, right? That he's family to him, right? And he typically doesn't understand what the heck he's talking about. He's like, what? what are you talking about? Um, and he says, I never injured thee. I love you better than you can devise. Good Capulet, you know, be satisfied. And then Mercutio gets annoyed with Romeo and says, oh, calm, dishonorable, vile submission. He can't stand that Tybalt is being such a bully and that Romeo is backing down in the face of him, right? So again, Back to the questions, Tybalt doesn't want to fight Mercutio, even though Mercutio is making fun of him because he is looking for Romeo, okay? So the dramatic irony of the situation in the next scene is of course that we know that he's already married to Juliet, and that's why he's saying that he doesn't want to fight Tybalt because he's because Tybalt is, is family to him, right? Okay, now some crazy stuff happens, right? Tybalt gets his sword out. Romeo begs him to put it up, um, but Mercutio responds, and Mercutio and Tybalt start fighting. Now, Romeo is horrified because fighting in the streets, and we know it could be the result of that after the prince's decree, right? 
Now, what, how you got to read the stage directions carefully here. Romeo tries to break up the fight, right? Now, you, this is up to you, uh, maybe up to the director of the play, how you would direct the scene. Are Tybalt and Mercutio really trying to hurt each other with their swords? Or are they just kind of having like an ego, you know, fencing match and see who's a better swordsman, right? I don't know. It's up to all, all these are Shakespeare's original words here, so you can interpret it however you like. A lot of people interpret it that it's not super serious, right? It's just an ego thing. And then tragically, Romeo gets between them, blocks their view. Tybalt thrusts at Mercutio in such a way that Mercutio can't see it coming, and he is wounded. At this point, we don't know how badly he is wounded, right? So, what are some of the things he says? I am hurt, a plague on both your houses. I am sped. Is he gone and half nothing? So, Tybalt runs off after that accidentally happens because he's horrified, like, he probably didn't mean to do that, even though he may not like Mercutio, right? What do you think Mercutio means by this famous line as he yells, a plague on both your houses? Who's he talking to and what does he mean? What do you think? You can figure that out, right? It's like he's yelling at everybody, a plague on your houses. He's cursing both the families. Yeah, good. Right? The translation pretty much tells us, right? If you, if you, if you can't figure it out yourself. Um, yeah, he's issuing a curse on both the families because it is both of their faults for this overall feud that he is now hurt. And actually, how badly is he hurt? We know, right? He's about to die. He's bleeding out, right? He says, a scratch, a scratch, but, but, but it's enough, enough to kill me. Only Mercutio would make jokes while he's bleeding out, right? It's not so deep as a well nor wide as a church door, but it's enough. It'll serve. Ask for me tomorrow. You shall find me a grave man. There's a great example of a pun, right? A really dark pun. Um, grave can mean serious, like gravely serious, right? But then grave also has connotations of a grave in the ground. And he also means that literally he's peppered for the worms in the ground, right? Okay, so they take him off, right? Maybe to get him to a doctor or something. But then he hears a little bit later, and Villa comes running back and says, Brave Mercutio is dead. And then Romeo sounds different here, doesn't he? This day's black fate on more days doth depend. This but begins the woe others must end. Like, all right, I'm mad. I'm pissed. My friend is dead. It's partly my fault, but I'm going to take it out on Tybalt. Tybalt comes back again. Romeo goes to fight him, and Romeo kills Tybalt. Oh boy, this is messed up, isn't it? Now, there's two reasons this is really messed up, right? What are the two reasons that this is horrible? Romeo killing Tybalt. That's not one of your questions directly, but you tell me. Or give me one, at least. Yeah, Leah. He's Juliet's family. Good, yeah. That's going to be awkward, <laughs> right? And then what's the other one? The one they were concerned about with the fighting in the first place. Romeo oh, could be punished to death. Exactly. And that's the big question, right? And that's what the prince has to come in and face. You know, does he execute the person who kills someone who killed someone else and he would have executed anyway? It's kind of a, a dilemma, right? Okay. And then he, let's see here. Back to questions. Um, first of all, he says, what does Romeo mean when he says Juliet's beauty hath made him effeminate? All right, now that is kind of a, a dated line, right? We wouldn't put it that way because it sounds sexist to us. We don't want to say that someone sounds like they're being wimpy by saying a guy is acting like a girl, right? But that's the way that anyone would have said it back then. So that's the way Shakespeare wrote it, unfortunately. So that's what he means by that. Um, and then he says, I'm fortune's fool, right? Oh, I'm fortune's fool. I would imagine him just like shaking his fist at the heavens and screaming that. What do you think he means by that? It seems like to him that no matter what he does, what keeps happening? Or it seems like what is in control rather than him being in control, which may or may not be true. Well, what is fortune? If you look at fortune as like a force, what would be like a, maybe another way of another word that we could use to refer to that force? It's not exactly, fate. yeah, not exactly God, but more fate, right? And not even exactly luck. I don't, I don't think that's a good translation there. It's not I have awful luck. Fortune is more kind of fate, right? Because that's what the prologue at the beginning kind of implied, right? They're star-crossed lovers and their fate is cursed, 
And so no matter what he does, it seems like it's turning out badly, right? Okay, so the prince shows up um, and the families are both making their arguments. Of course, Lady Capulet um, thinks that Romeo should be executed because he killed Tybalt, right? And the Montagues think that he shouldn't be executed because Tybalt would have been executed by the prince because he killed Mercutio, right? And they both kind of have a good argument. You know, if you're the prince, what the heck do you do? Well, he does make a decision, doesn't he? So Benvolio gives an account of everything that happened, which is pretty, you know, pretty straightforward and true and objective. They make their arguments. And what does the prince decide to do? That is your last question for the scene. What's his solution and punishment for Romeo? Ban him to the other city instead of killing him. Thank you. Ban him from the city, exile him, banish him. All right now, you would think that he would think that that's better than death, right? Um, but that's going to be pretty tough, right? As you'll see them, you know, get all stressed about uh, in a little bit here, because um, that means they would both be alive, but not be able to see each other. And with how dramatic these two are about each other already, and having already married, it's kind of hard to imagine how that's going to work. Um, and the only way they could solve it would be if Julia like ran away or something, and she's barely fourteen. So. We'll see. All right, let's quickly talk through the next scene. So Juliet is by herself and she is waiting for Romeo to come and spend the night with her since they were married on this day, right? Um, so that would be a soliloquy, okay, if you didn't get that. Okay, there's no one else there and she's speaking about her emotions out loud as if she's talking to someone. It's a dramatic convention of plays that wouldn't really happen in real life, right? Okay, so she goes on, she's feeling really impatient yet looking forward to seeing him and the nurse comes, okay? Now she's supposed to bring the cords, which is like a rope ladder that Romeo will you know, use to ascend to her chamber and spend the night with her. And the nurse just starts babbling on, oh, he's dead, he's dead, we're on duty, he's, he's dead, he's dead, he's old. And of course, Juliet assumes what? The nurse is really messing up here because Juliet thinks that what has happened. Number two, in scene two. What does Juliet think that the nurse means has happened mistakenly? She thinks that Romeo is dead. She thinks that Romeo is dead, right? And of course, that's not the case. But the you know the nurse is just kind of dumb and like you know talking without thinking, and then she eventually gets control of herself and says. Tybalt is gone, Romeo banished, Romeo that killed him, he is banished. All right, and then she says, oh, did Romeo's hand shut Tybalt's blood? He's going, oh my God, my husband killed my uh, husband killed my cousin, right? And then she starts freaking out, of course, right? Um, what does she basically uh, imply that she might do here? Did you catch that? Maybe not so surprising, let me tell how dramatic they are. What does she threaten to do? Die. Yeah, like take her own life, right? All right, so the nurse makes her feel better that she's going to uh, get Romeo to comfort her after they argue about it for a little bit, bring him back. And she feels a little bit comfort about that, but she's still freaking out about how, how, how the word banished sounds like, you know, worse than death, right? I'll find Romeo to comfort you. I know well where he is. Your Romeo will be here at night. All to him, he has hit it fresh. She knows that he is a Friar Lawrence's cell. And that kind of takes us into the next scene. Bid him come to take his last farewell. All right, I won't keep any longer and I will record a video uh, reviewing uh, both scene three with questions, scene four, which you didn't have questions in scene five. And in the meantime, you guys make sure that you are working on your personal narrative. You are gonna need to read through act four and do that by Thursday night. Okay, so you have kind of three nights at this point to do both of those things. Get near the end of the quarter and we got to finish this stuff. But Act Four is uh, actually pretty short. Okay, so there's not nearly as much to read. I don't think as many questions either. Okay, let me stop screen sharing here. Oh, where'd my mouse go? There it is. Okay, anybody have any questions about what's going on? This is a big push. Good bit of work to do this week. Let's stay strong and finish it all and get a good grade this quarter. Okay. 
All right. Thanks for your participation, guys. See you soon.